To foster economic growth and development, governments need sustainable sources of funding for social programs and public investments. Programs providing health, education, infrastructure, and other services are important to achieve the common goal of a prosperous, functional, and orderly society. And they require that governments raise revenues. Taxation not only pays for public goods and services, it is also a key ingredient in the social contract between citizens and the economy as well as the government. When news broke that Nigeria's Federal Inland Revenue Service, FIRS, was alleging that Multi-Choice Nigeria owed over 1.8 trillion naira as well as more than $300,000 in taxes, there were several reactions and several questions. Multi-Choice is the owner of cable pay TV service provider DSTV. The FIRS said that the entertainment company has not complied with tax regulations. Multi-Choice says it has been complying with all requirements of the tax body and has paid up all its tax obligations. Today, we're looking at the Multi-Choice in Nigeria tax issue. I'm Tolu Lopwe, Adile Rubalogun. Welcome. This is Business Edge. Now joining me today is Wale Ajayi, he's a partner, Tax Regulatory and People Services at KPMG Advisory Services. Wale, thank you um, you're for joining us on Business Edge and welcome to the show. It's my pleasure to be here. All right, Wale, let me start with this. There have been a lot of reactions since this news particularly broke involving Multi-Choice Nigeria and by extension, uh, Multi-Choice, the parent company based in South Africa. And many people are watching very closely to see what happens. What was your initial reaction when you heard the news just a few days ago? Well, uh, it wasn't surprising, but uh, let's first make this uh, statement that uh, it's an allegation or it is proved. Right, uh, we've heard from much choice. Much choice has debunked the allegation by FRS. And uh, so we need to first touch on that premise. Mm -hmm. But based on what we know, uh, at least based on what has been reported in the papers, uh, the allegation has arisen as a result of supposedly non compliance by much choice in providing documents. So what appears to have happened is that uh, the FRS has assessed what, is, what may likely be like a team you know, best of judgment assessment based on the information available to it. So it's something that is common. Uh, it's not something that is strange. But of course, what is strange is the amount itself, 1.8 mm. trillion. Mm. That's a lot of money. Uh, but I think the parties will have to work together, you know, to solve this problem. And okay. The All right. So you did talk about uh, the information available. So let's get to that. The FRS said in their statement, that multi-choice's performance does not reflect in their tax obligations and compliance level in the country. The executive chairman of the FIRS, Mohamed Nami, said that Nigeria contributes 34 percent of the total revenue for the multi-choice group. According to the FIRS's intelligence gathering, next is Kenya with 11 percent and Zambia is in third place with 10 percent. The 1.8 trillion naira owed is supposed to be about 32 percent of what the company generates overall as profit. If this is true, that would make Multi-Choice Nigeria easily one of the biggest companies that we have in the country. What do you think of these numbers? And again, as you said, um, according to available sources, this is what the FIRS has been able to come up with because they're saying that the company has refused to grant access to their books. Okay, let me start by saying that um, the amount in question does not relate only to corporate income tax, which is the 30% of profit. It goes beyond that, right? So it can also include VAT, value added tax. It can also include what we call capital gains tax. It can also include uh, taxes. So it's difficult to make an assessment just based on the profits. Mm. Uh, what typically happens is that um, companies in Nigeria are required to file their returns you know, within six months of the year end. And once the returns are filed, they pay the taxes you know, based on the returns they've self-assessed, right? The FRS then have the ability or the power to then audit those records. So what appears to have happened is that um, FRS have not been able to carry out an audit despite, um, well, based on the, uh, what has been reported, various attempts, you know, to get assets, you know, to the records of their of multi-choice. So that is where we are today. Uh, but again, before they can actually 
trial and get an interim order. There are processes to be followed. It's not enough to say that uh, we can't get access. And because we can't get access, we cannot ask the banks you know, to freeze the, the bank account. There are processes to be followed. So the question then is, as FRS, you know, have they followed those processes? I guess uh, we can talk about those processes later on in the program. Yes. All right. So let's also talk about some of the doubts. You've also talked about what could make up this 1.8 trillion Naira and the 300 plus thousand um, that's being uh, levied against multi-choice as tax avoidance or tax fraud, as the FRS is saying. But it also calls into question the actions or the work of the FRS itself, because the chairman also said the company has not paid VAT since inception. Doesn't this also point to a failure of the FRS? An entity that is a corporate entity doing business in Nigeria, duly registered, is somehow able to avoid paying tax for a number of years. While you can lay blame on that company, do you not also blame a regulator that's allowing this to happen for a number of years up to 1.8 trillion naira? What do you say about that? You're right. Uh, first and foremost, right, you pay taxes on profits. So if there are no profits, I mean, when we're talking about corporate income tax, so it's possible if you, are, if you don't have profits, so there are no taxes to be paid. Of course, there is a concept of minimum tax that is applicable. Uh, what I suspect also, uh, before I go into that, let me also first address this. It's not enough to make an allegation of fraud, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what all they've done is that they've asserted fraud. It has to be proved, right? So we can't use the word fraud because they have to actually prove that uh, multi-choice has committed fraud. Okay. And it's not for them to say that they have to go to court and prove that multi-choice has actually defrauded, you know, government. Uh, so one of the issues that we have in the FRS, obviously, is the problem of uh, capacity. They don't have the resources to do the audit of all entities that are meant to be paying taxes in Nigeria. And that is why we as practitioners have been calling for them to adopt a risk-based approach. When you don't have the resources, you will stretch yourself thin. Just imagine the number of companies that you have in Nigeria and you don't have the resources. So what you tend to find out is that um, there is always a lag in the time they carry out an audit. So, for example, you might have submitted your returns last year and it might take another four years or five years for them to come to you to do an audit. So that is an operational issue that the FRS needs to address. So that may explain you know, why it appears that they have not carried out an audit for a very long time. It's just because they don't have the capacity they don't have the resources, so they have to change the way they carry out an audit by implementing a risk-based audit approach and focus on the taxpayers that are believed to be of high risk and of moderate risk and just leave those ones that are medium risk. So that's the process change that they need to embark on. All right. I like the fact that you said as you started this answer that you can only pay taxes on profit. Because uh, there have been, as we said, allegations, you're saying at this point, fraud is not a word we should be using until the courts um, are involved in this. But it's also been said that companies like multi-choice Nigeria, not necessarily just multi-choice, have intercompany structures where you have a situation where parent companies charge their local subsidiaries certain operational costs. And then by the time these companies deduct these costs, they are saying that they're declaring a loss. Uh, we've seen companies like MultiChoice as well who have parent companies elsewhere repatriating their funds home while also pleading for tax waivers locally and then saying that they've been declaring losses for the past few years. How is the FIRS addressing this? Because this seems to be an issue that has been going on for a number of times or a number of years with companies that have local franchises and subsidiaries versus their parent company operational structures. First and foremost, there is nothing wrong in uh, having intercompany costs. Uh, what you have at times is that you have the multi-choice in South Africa that holds the intellectual property. I mean, obviously, for that intellectual property, they have to charge the Nigeria entity, you know, for the utilization of that property, right? But what the tax law says is that those prices have to be at arm's length. So there is a process, what we call a transfer pricing process documentation, that would have been carried out to establish that the prices reflect, you know, arm's length, right? If that is done, then there is no issue. Now, if as a result of that issue, that the Nigerian company makes a loss, then that's a different thing entirely. Now, it is now the responsibility of the FRS to look at the records and ascertain that there is support for the expenses that have been incurred and that there is substance to those expenses because we can have support. The other question you then need to ask yourself is that is there substance you know, to, that ex to that expense? So, for example, you can have a company that is taking an interest at a loan that has 
you know, borrow some money from the bank, right? And you can see the interest expense in your books. But the question is, does that company need to have taken the loan in the first instance? Should they have taken the loan? So that is a substance issue. So that is what the FRS needs to establish. But I think what is very important for us to understand is that there are processes. And hopefully, right, FRS is following the process. But because you can, before you can actually freeze a, 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 the taxpayer's account, you have to follow a process. You can't just make an announcement and the bank will then you know, accept or implement what you have, what you have wanted. And at that point, I want us to take up after the break because the FRS um, also actually stated a number of relevant laws that they say have given them the right to ask banks in Nigeria to act as agents for them to reclaim this. But before we get into that, there are two other issues that have popped up um, regarding this issue. And one is the subscriber base. Now, according to the FRS, they're saying that that um, the Multitrust Nigeria has refused to allow them to know how many subscribers that they have. And this comes to the issue of VAT and VAT remittance. FRS, uh, Multitrust Nigeria, I beg your pardon, is saying that the FRS does not understand the nature of the environment they work in, that people may pay this month and not pay next month. So we're having this conversation around how many subscribers there are. FRS is saying about 20 million, and MCN is saying that that number is not even the entire number that they have across the continent. Why is this number of subscribers for Multi-Choice Nigeria such a, um, a, a pivotal point in this conversation about taxes? Yeah, because the number of subscribers will determine revenue I mean, for corporate tax purposes. And of course, we know the rates that uh, based on various plans that subscribers may have. So it's very important for them to have subscribers. Now, why I find it difficult to understand is this. Uh, because FRS actually do have the power to access the records and documentation, right? So I know they've said that they've tried to get access and they've not been able to get access. But you can actually, you know, issue a warrant or, or you know, access, and the information will be provided. Because if you if you obstruct the tax authority from carrying out its duty, it's a criminal offence, and they have the right, like, to carry to call on the police or any security agencies to ensure that they have access. So what I suspect is that this has not been done. I think that there's probably some disputes as to some of the issues that have been done. And then far as we just have taken you know, a preemptive test, a uh, preemptive uh, step. But I think the issue of subscriber is very critical. The information will be there. I mean, because I'm sure that the accounts of purchasers uh, are being audited and they can easily see the figure. It's just a matter of, you know, taking the right steps you know, to get the information. But the whole idea is to determine the revenue and also to determine the revenue for operators' purposes and for VAT purposes. That is why the number of subscribers is extremely important. But of course, you also need to look at the timing of payment, uh, because there are people that pay in advance over a period of time, yes. and you have to then be able to relate the payment to the particular year in question. The fact that some subscribers are paid in advance doesn't mean that the money is revenue in the hands of multi choice. Actually, it represents liability, because they can only you know, um, allocate the, the revenue or the payment they receive to the period in question. All right, Swale, I want you to hold on. When we come back, we're going to take another one of the big issues that seems to be bedeviling this conversation, and that has to do with the franchisees and the parent company. And we'll also get into the processes. Now, the FIRS here in Nigeria is saying that they have relevant laws behind them for ordering Nigerian banks to freeze the company's accounts and also help them recover the alleged amounts owed. The conversation will continue right after this. This is Business Edge, and today we're looking at the multi-choice and Nigeria tax issue. My guest is Wale Ajayi, partner, tax regulatory and people services at KPMG Advisory Services. So next on the agenda is another issue that has come up in this conversation. So Wale, one of the other things has been um, how this conversation involves franchise private firms. Um, apparently, the FIRS is asking that 
Multi-Choice Nigeria directed subsist, uh, subsidiaries to give it access to their own books so that they can assess. It's back to this payment of tax issue. Now, Multi-Choice is saying they cannot demand or instruct because these are private companies and they're franchisees to them. So how does this, how is there going to be a compromise in this conversation? Are we saying that those who are franchisees to Multi-Choice, uh, Multi-Choice Nigeria are not giving the FRIS access to their books? They're not paying taxes? Why is this an issue at all? Okay, um, so there is a bit of tax that we call between taxes, right? So, um, the way it works is that um, if um, a company has provided uh, a service to another company, the company that has received that service then has the, 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 has the obligation to withhold certain amount of taxes, right, before paying the person who has provided the service, right? So that is what the FRS is getting at. So the only way they can get that information and to be able to confirm, you know, whether those people that provide services to to multi-choice are far returns. Again, it's also a function of whether they're individuals or they're companies, because FRS only deals with companies. State tax authorities deals with individuals. Is to look at it from the source, and so they can look at it from the books of, of uh, multi-choice, and that is where the information has to be provided from, right? If those um, contractors are companies, then they can then look at the the information provided by multi-choice and compare with the information already provided by those contractors. So, but the whole essence is to ensure that um, they can align the information and there is consistency in the information. But like I said, FRS have the authority. So I really don't understand what is going on to demand for, uh, many information, any document and uh, multi-choice or any taxpayers for that matter have to comply with that information, except if they don't have the information. Then that would be a different issue at time. Okay. And it is important in this conversation, once again, to note that Multi-Choice has denied the allegations. They said that they have complied with all of the regulatory uh, laws that Nigeria has, the FIRS as well. In a statement, they've also said that they actually haven't heard officially from the authority. And I, and I wonder what you think about this. So this news broke on Thursday. It's all over the papers. There's been one or two statements from the FRS. Uh, but Multi-Choice is saying officially they have not been given, I guess maybe would say, a note uh, that they owe this amount of tax. What do you think about that? OK, so let me just spend some time to provide some perspective. It is possible, right, that the Multi-Choice may not have had from the FRS with respect to the prison of the account. Now, but in terms of the assessment communication, if it is true that uh, multi choice did not provide documents, then FRS have the power to assess what we call a best of judgment. That is based on the understanding of the size and magnitude of operations of multi choice. Mm. We think your liability will be this much. And then they would then issue what is called an assessment notice. An assessment notice just gives you information about the tax that is due based on best of judgment and they send it to, to multi-choice. Now, multi-choice then has the ability to respond, right, within 30 days by objecting. If multi-choice has not objected within 30 days, what that means is that the amount stipulated in that assessment has become final mm. and conclusive. So that means it has become a debt that is payable by multi-choice. Now, under the law, there is a practice direction that, in fact, I mean, there is a process by which FRS can actually freeze the account of, 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 of multi choice, right? And they've talked about the power of substitution or what have you. But recently, the Federal High Court, in a bid to try and uh, expedite cases, tax cases in Nigeria, especially given the, the catch constraints and the ability to raise money, right? Issue what is called a practice direction that became effective 1st of June 2021. And what does it say? It says that the FRS can actually seek what is called an ex parte motion, a motion. That is, without notifying multi-choice, they will seek that ex parte motion, file it at the ICOM, and all they need to do is to is to accompany that motion with an affidavit, right, and a written address, and the copy of the assessment notice that shows that the assessment has become final and conclusive. Mm -hmm. A judge will look at it. They don't need to hear from, from multi-choice. That okay. that. A judge will look at it, and if a judge grants the interim order for the freezing, the account will stay frozen. But then thereafter, within a certain period of time, 14 days, 14 days, the FRS can then file what is called a motion of notice. And that is what that is at that point that uh, multi-choice can become aware that the accounts have been frozen. 
I mean, obviously, if the account is frozen, they will know because uh, they can't be able, they will not be able to access that account. So there is a law that actually empowers the parents, you know, to freeze account. So it's possible that the taxpayer may not have had, you know, in terms of the freezing of account, but they will have had, they will have received correspondence from their parents with respect to the assessment itself. And, and I'm I think sure that the parents have done that. And I think this is a very valuable note because in, in parts of the statement, the FRS has, of course, said that they have the powers in Section 49 of the Companies Income Tax Act as amended, Section 41 of the Value Added Tax Act, Section 31 of the FIRS Establishment Act, and they've basically said all bankers to MCA Africa, that's Multi-Choice Africa, and MCN, Multi-Choice Nigeria, can act as a, a collecting agents for the full recovery of the aforesaid tax debt. So what you're telling me makes it seem like there's been some legal movements behind the scene before some of this stuff broke. And we're, we're going to have to assume, because none of the statements that have been released by the FRS have alluded to the fact that they've gone to court to do this. They've just simply talked about the, uh, the laws in place that give them the power to appoint banks. Let me ask a very valuable question, because this is not the only company. Multi-choice um, is not the only company that has faced this issue with tax. We know of the MTN situation, the Atisalat situation, and many people are worried as to what this will show to potential foreign investors in Nigeria. If someone was a foreign investor and they're seeing such big companies, multinational companies in Nigeria facing these tax issues and what seems to be maybe a lack of process, a lack of conversation, a lack of meeting at the table, what do you think they will take away from this? I think the first point we need to establish is that every company, irrespective of whether they're a national company, local company, or multinational company, needs to comply with the laws of the land, yes. right? That is very important for us to first establish. And then the second point that I would like to make is that the tax authorities, uh, authorities and the regulators also have to ensure that due process is followed, right? Before they do anything that is asked, that may put investors on, right? So I must say that what I think is missing or what is causing all these issues is that there seems to have been lack of engagement and what we're seeing is that we're seeing all sorts of issues being debated on the pages of newspaper. Mm. There has to be communication. There has to be engagement. That is the only way that this issue, you know, can be resolved. And I think that um, both parties that really have to come together. And it's very easy to resolve uh, because the issue is a matter of fact. Am I, is there a liability, right? The books will show whether there's a liability. Has it been established? It's pretty straightforward. And they can resolve the issue. So what I would say is that it's, the, it's in the interest of Nigeria to ensure that we follow due process, but I also will also have to emphasize that every company, irrespective of where they are, must, I mean, where they are incorporated or registered from, have to follow the laws of the land. And if you've chosen to work in Nigeria, to carry out business in Nigeria, then you need to follow, you know, the laws of the land. And All again, right. we made the point that it's an allegation until it is proved. Mm. All right, so Wale, we will be following this very closely because there are some who believe this could end in litigation. You're saying negotiation with them meeting at the table. There's the conversation around whether or not it is actually 1.8 trillion naira that it's owed, how much eventually will be paid if a debt is established. So as we find out more, we'll definitely be touching base with you to find out how this plays out. Wale Ajayi, thank you as always for joining me. Thank you so much, Shalom. Have a great day. You too. Bye. And this is a very big issue, especially for a country such as Nigeria, where foreign direct investment has actually dipped over the past one year. Foreign direct investment in the continent is going elsewhere, other than the continent's largest economy. What does that mean for us? A lot of questions. Hopefully, we'll be getting you the answers right here on Business Edge. We'll take a quick, very quick timeout, and I'll give you NC4 to watch before we wrap things up. And here are a few stories we're keeping our eyes on before we wrap things up on Business Edge. We start with South Africa, where Pick and Pay and other stores say that some of their outlets have been impacted by looting and violence in various parts of Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal, but that those in other parts of the country are continuing to operate as normal. In areas that have been hit by the looting, these outlets will remain closed until calm, law and order has been restored. Malawi and Zimbabwe have signed a bilateral trade agreement in order to boost trade between the two countries. This new agreement follows one that was signed in 1995.
The Democratic Republic of Congo and Burundi have also signed vital agreements aimed at strengthening their ties. The agreements include several beneficial projects, such as constructing bridges for vehicles and pedestrians that will link both countries, as well as the development of agricultural and infrastructural amenities that will benefit both Central African countries. And number four on our list, finally, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emefiele, has assured that the Infrastructure Corporation of Nigeria will commence operation by the third quarter. The corporation, recently approved by President Muhammadu Buhari with a capital base of 15 trillion naira, has been appointed as transaction advisors for the corporation. And that is, of course, our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Take us with you wherever you go by, of course, downloading our mobile app on the App Store and the Play Store. You can, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we are live 24 hours a day. And watch us live on Star Time Channel 274. I'm Tolu Lokwe, I'll be back once again talking business, the big financial, economic, and business stories coming to you from here on the African continent, because we keep Africa first. <laughs>